For Furby is a new way to develop, build, and regulate better. It takes thinking differently. The process of development is simple. A developer contracts with a farmer who then contracts typically with a local civil engineer who's going to look at the regulations to squeeze as many homes as possible onto the site, do a presentation to show how he meets the regulations, and then you end up with a subdivision of land. How to recognize waste. There's a tremendous amount of waste in this plan, but do you see it? Let me show you. The streets highlighted in red have no frontage. Not too bad, but the streets highlighted in gray have frontage on both sides of the street. That street is being 100% utilized. All the other streets that you see that are not shaded are a form of waste, at least 50%. The city gives a certain amount of criteria the land developer has to hold, but it's not the land developer laying out the site. It's the engineer that's going to lay out the site. And the more complex this paint-by-numbers is, the less likely the city is to get an attractive, functional neighborhood. This is the problem. So we have to take and look at regulations differently so that we could write regulations that actually perform better. Let's look at pedestrian connectivity. I happen to live in a grid. Everybody thinks the shortest distance is the straight line between two points. And that is true if I want to take and walk to the lake. But I have two restaurants by me. Two that, if you look at a straight line distance, are walkable. But because of the grid, I cannot walk straight to these restaurants. So I have to walk a half a mile or two-thirds of a mile out of my way, which means I'm going to get in my car and drive to these restaurants. So why can't we design the pedestrian system first? This is an existing development plan of a approximately 700 homes. The walking system is the street system. So why not take a look at the destinations and design the main trails first? In this case, you have two minor collectors that bisect this neighborhood into four different neighborhoods. We design a circular trail to bind those neighborhoods together and then a straight trail to the retail and hospital at the corner. And then we design the neighborhood around it. So the main trails define the neighborhood. We have elegant, wide, meandering walks that encourage a stroll. Diffusers, they add safety by having an island in the street where the driver must pay attention, and that's where you want the pedestrians across one-way lanes. The walks that pull away from an intersection increase safety significantly. Wider walks even can be used for emergency vehicle access. Now let's take a look at vehicular connectivity. Why is Isaac Newton so important? Well, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. That body is a 4,000 pound car. So when we look at normal driving conditions, to get to residential cruise speed takes about 200 feet. And then eventually you're going to have to come to a stop. That also takes about 200 feet. So 400 foot is what we call flow cycle. You are incredibly inefficient for time and energy within that flow cycle. This is the original approved plat of the Enclave at West Point in New Bronzeville. We could start seeing the waste in half-fronted streets. But what about the waste of flow? So let's take a scenario. You live over there and you enter the subdivision. When we look at distances, you never reach 400 feet. You're always in that flow cycle, plus you're going to have to pause at those intersections, at least slow down, so your average speed is going to be about 8 miles an hour. So the idea was to relay out this neighborhood in a much more efficient design and having a main street approach. In other words, one street should define the neighborhood. It's the empowering street that you maintain flow on. So time and energy plummet no matter where you live on average. We had a 33% reduction in street length, a gain in premium settings, and we maintained the exact same density. So there's a third less street for the city to maintain forever. And the city has an increased tax base because of those premiums. So the developer wins and the city wins, but more important, the residents win. Before today's technology, it was impossible to solve this density for versus space without sacrificing developers' profits. And we can deliver a new era of technology 
a new type of geometry that solves a lot of these problems. So, remember that first lesson and the waste in this plan? By having a pattern that collects the different areas of the site, we can have 0% waste. And then what we could do is have typically a lot less street length, maintaining the same density, and possibly in some cases, possibly increasing density. There is no CAD software that can replicate a result when there is no replication. We have to go back and do what the developers are paying us to do, not let the CAD package design for us. When we look at the example where we designed the trails first, what we really did was when we did the street pattern, there was a dramatic plummeting of the lineal foot of street. When we look at the lineal foot of the street difference, it was 38%. The typical development that we redesign is between 20 and 30%. So we gained 19 acres of land. Let's say the land was 60,000 an acre. That's over a million dollars that goes back into the lots and not given to the city. So we really freed up $11 million, or in this case, $16,000 plus per home, that can be used for better architecture, landscaping, and other elements that makes more value. That's about a $40,000 bubble of pavement. Why is it needed? Well, the engineer wanted to create an extra lot in there, so he stretched the building setback line, but he takes a look at the regulations, and regulations require 20-foot front yard. That means he's going to have to build that bubble to get that extra lot. The regulations never said 20-foot front yard. We can expand beyond the 20-foot. Is it legal? Sure it is. Why? Because every regulation on the planet has a magic word. It's a magic word that we use to create a new form of geometry. And what's that magic word? It's minimum. The magic word is minimum. We, the idea is to gain efficiency by exceeding minimum. It's a different way to think. Now, when we take a look at a cul-de-sac that gets the sidewalks, for example, go to nowhere. A snowplow operator's nightmare, and it's a massive amount of pavement. But what's the logic behind that cul-de-sac? It's a minimum fire engine radius. We can create a better cul-de-sac by making everything bigger. We could take a wide emergency trail walk through the neighborhood. Now we don't have a cul-de-sac length maximum because there's an emergency exit. We go one way around the pavement because that's the way it's, the people are going to drive anyhow. Snow can be pushed to the island. We gain a park and we pull the homes further set back. So how does it compare? Well, we've just doubled the amount of premium lots. We gain a park, we eliminate the connectivity problem, and we have the same density. With this new era of geometry, homes don't have to parallel the curb line. This means we could flare homes along arterial streets. So when the market passes the development, they're not looking at homers. They're looking at home fronts and corridors of open space pulling back doubles or triples the amount of premium lots. For example, the home at the lower left corner here can easily see the lake flaring out the homes, brings the open space not only in the front of the homes but also in the back of the home so it's visible from the street. Homes that are at angles to each other and the street increase the view shed from within the home to the outside. Land use transition, the original approved concept plan on the left, showcases strip malls and townhomes. You have to drive through the cheap housing to get to the more expensive housing. That showcases not only the neighborhood bad, but the entire city bad. No street defines a neighborhood. Townhomes and multifamily take control of the visual impact of the neighborhood. On the right, we actually gained 120 units by having a much more efficient plan where single family prevails. Which one do you think is more sustainable? The wasteful plan that uses traditional suburban transitional zoning or the one on the right that reverses that transition? So what's missing in all this conversation? Well, it's architecture. And we can't create a collaborative industry when planners, surveyors, architects, and engineers don't communicate. And they don't communicate because of several problems that exist in the industry. And one of the things is there's no common technology and there's no common knowledge base. So what we've done is we created it. The land mentor system that we developed teaches a common knowledge base, 
creating a new era of consultants to serve cities and developers. So this new era merges architecture and planning. So for example, this is my house. This would be my view if I bought a house, plan A from a builder. The new paradigm that merges architecture and planning, which could be as simple as flipping a plan and adding windows, creates a different living environment, a different value proposition. Instead of looking at a building by rooftop, let's look at what happens inside that building. Where's the windows? Where are you going to hang out? Where's the view? From a human scale, not from a bird's eye view. With the Bay Homes, what we're doing is we're creating a new form of neighborhood. And we've done thousands of these over the years. Architectural shaping adds tremendous value to suburban development. As density increases, the value of a home decreases because it gets narrow and it gets deep. When we use Land Mentor to do a spatial analysis of this house, we see that 8.1% of it's in hallway space. If the house is a quarter million dollars, that meant the owner spent $20,000 in hallway. When we look at the house in Land Mentor, we could see the living spaces and we could see the views are pretty awful. When we look at the perimeter of the building, 196 feet, and we look at the actual viewable area, there is hardly any viewable area. But if we can lay this neighborhood out and guarantee a minimum angle between lots, we can make that narrow home wider. The way it works is we come up with a minimum angle, work with the architect to make the homes wider in the back, wider in the front, position the living spaces in the windows so you could at least get a panoramic view, then what you've got is a completely different value proposition without losing any density. We can have a wider front porch and not have to reset the garage. Now the porch dominates the home front. So we can have side windows to expand views. As you enter the home, we can have space that goes through the home and eliminate hallway space. The same thing with homes that are on the outside of the curb. So we can't do too much about the curb appeal, but we can ha do a lot about the function of the home. Another example would be this home. The home on the right is 39 feet with a 6-inch roof overhang would be on a 50-foot wide lot. The home on the left is made wider. How? When we take a look at the floor plan, the lot angle allows the width to increase at the street. But the home doesn't have to be as deep, which means we have a bigger backyard because we want to maintain the square footage of the original home. And because the home isn't as deep, we are able to make it a foot wider. But when you look at entering the home, the feel is completely different. Which home would you rather enter every day? So when we did Transona at Vieira, what they were going to build was the above. What you see below is the same density with a 35-foot wide home product that doesn't look 35-foot wide. Why? Because it's not. We were able to create a wider home at the same density.